Thank you very much, Susan, Stephen, uh, friends all. Uh, it's uh, wonderful to be here and the sun is coming out. Uh, it's, uh, it's very good to see John Lydon from McKinsey, who I know uh, uh, is going to be speaking later. We were both at the St Vincent CEO sleep out last night and uh, I think we've both scrubbed up reasonably well, wouldn't you say? Had nothing like a shave and a shower. Now, when Lord Byron travelled to Greece in 1812, he declared in his great work, Child Harold's Pilgrimage, fair Greece, sad relic of departed worth, immortal though no more, though fallen great. In many ways, he wasn't just talking about Greece's departed worth as measured by its cultural or artistic output, but actual economic output. As Angus Madison's project to track historic national accounts shows, Greece's per capita income in the age of Byron was only around 20% higher than it was in the age of Plutarch. For many millennia, economic life was much the same for each successive generation. The problem, the phenomenon of rapid technological change and with it the displacement of large chunks of the labour force is a relatively new one. Perhaps the first social movement protesting against automation and the threat it posed to labour was the Luddite movement in the early 19th century, workers protesting at Foxconn facilities about being replaced by robots is a current incarnation of the same phenomenon. In 1930, John Maynard Keynes wrote of the fantastic and frenetic changes occurring around him, with output per head in US factories increasing 40% in just five years. The increase of technical efficiency, he wrote, has been taking place faster than we can deal with the problem of labour absorption. He predicted that within a century, output per head would be four to eight times greater and the work week would be reduced to around 15 hours to be replaced by a culture of leisure. <laughs> he, was, uh, he was outright in terms of growth at least, if not in terms of leisure. 85 years on, an Australian and US output per head has grown by a factor of six. And there's also been a huge shift of jobs from traditional sectors. In 1900, one in four Australians were employed in agriculture. As of May, agriculture accounted for slightly more than 2% of total jobs. As late as 1970, manufacturing accounted for 28% of the workforce. It now accounts for just over 7%. The short point is, that in an open, dynamic, globally competitive market economy, jobs lost in relatively declining sectors will be made up for in new ones. What Keynes didn't foresee, however, was just how transformative new innovations would be, bringing not just new ways of creating old products, but new waves of demand and the need for skilled inputs. The economists Claudia Golden and Lawrence Katz famously wrote about the race between education and technology, and it appears that humans have for the most part stayed ahead of the curve of technological change by moving up the value chain faster than computers. A 1965 report by NASA summed up our inherent advantage, and I quote, man is the lowest cost, 150 pound, non-linear, all-purpose computer system which can be mass-produced by unskilled labour. <laughs> but as Hugh, as Hugh Durrant-White <coughs> and the team from NICTA point out, 40% uh, of the workforce, or around 5 million Australian jobs, are at risk of being placed, replaced by machines in the next 10 to 15 years. This study largely reinforces an earlier work by Oxford's Martin School in 2013 which found that a slightly larger proportion of US workers, around 47%, will have their jobs threatened by computerisation in coming years. Part of the answer for Australia's workers is contained in these two studies. We are slightly less prone to automation than Americans because of the makeup of our workforce with relatively fewer workers in the service sector. What is different about the current wave of disruption referred to by some authors as a new wave of the Industrial Revolution, is the pace of change, driven in large part by a confluence of very significant trends, 
Each would be significant enough to disrupt traditional jobs, industries and business models in their own right. But together, they're having an irrevocable impact, not only on the way we work, but on just about every aspect of our lives. Now, the key to our future economic prosperity, our competitiveness and progress, is in large part contingent on our ability to counter some trends and embrace others, embrace them as we embrace the volatility of the future. They include the explosion in computer processing power and the relative affordability to store and transmit large volumes of data. Between 2009, the number of transistors per chip increased from 37.5 to 904 million. Today, there are about 2 billion transistors in an average smartphone, making it more powerful than the combined computing power of NASA in 1969. The opportunities of mass connectivity and mobility, which is accelerating the pace of globalisation and changing consumer behaviour from the way we exercise to the way we access entertainment. There are already as many mobile subscriptions, 7.5 billion, as there are people. And the share of smart devices is increasing. The ubiquity of the internet has also broken down barriers to entry. Startups can launch a new product directly to billions of consumers, and they do. The globalisation of supply chains is another important change. Trade is increasingly in intermediate goods, as distinct from finished products, and supply chains have become more sophisticated and integrated. Take the Apple iPhone 6, which includes components made by 785 suppliers in 31 countries. Regrettably, none of them Australia. And then there are also the demographic changes. Here, our ageing population and the impact this has on labour force participation, coupled with, incongruously, an unacceptably high level of youth unemployment, around 14%. As with previous cycles of technological progress, where the application of new technologies has led to greater automation, particularly in agriculture, manufacturing and now mining, the current rave of disruption will inevitably lead to job losses in other areas susceptible to automi automation and standardisation. While the prospect of five million jobs being lost to computers is alarming, it doesn't consider the types of jobs that will be created in the future. Technology will be leveraged to develop new goods and services. New innovations will emerge. Companies most susceptible to disruption will reinvent their business models as many, though not all, are doing today. Take Netflix as an example. In less than a decade, they cannibalised their DVD by mail business with an on-demand video streaming service. Today, Netflix alone counts for 30% of downstream internet traffic in North America, has 60 million subscribers worldwide and employs 2,450 people. Many of those jobs, at least at Netflix, would not exist today had they not cannibalised their old business model. The lesson for all of us, all businesses, is if you are not prepared to cannibalise your existing business model, your legacy business model, don't worry, somebody else will do it for you. Now, while many jobs, and in some cases entire industries, are at risk of being replaced by computers, Technology can be harnessed to create a net increase in employment. Our challenge is to ensure that enough Australians have the skills and the technological imagination to take advantage of new technologies, to approach disruption as an opportunity to invent and create, and not something that we seek to, to prevent or hold back. As Hugh Bradlow from Telstra observes in his chapter, one certainty about the economy and employment in the years ahead is that they will be shaped and affected by new technology. The reality is the future is here now, so we must be prepared to embrace change and uncertainty as our friend, not our foe. We must treat volatility as our friend, as an opportunity, not just as a threat. Now the question therefore is how in the face of all of this unprecedented change can we ensure that more jobs are created than are lost? And how do we ensure that the jobs created will deliver a higher standard of living 
than they do today. The, a the aim is not, as the Labor government used to say, future-proofing. That's neither possible nor desirable. It sees the future as more threat than opportunity. We need to ensure we have the infrastructure and the skills to embrace the future, to make volatility our friend, so that we can take advantage of all of the opportunities rapid change will involve. So let me pick up now on education and skills. Improvements in educational attainment and workforce skills enabled Australia to respond and ultimately benefit from past waves of technological disruption. For the most part, wages have increased, so too has discretionary spending, creating demand for new goods and services and ultimately improving our standard of living. In terms of formal qualifications, Australia has a highly skilled workforce. 25% of us have a tertiary qualification. Nearly 40% of 25 to 34 year olds have a bachelor's degree or higher, which is bo both of these numbers are above the OECD and G20 averages. But despite our educational attainment, we must ensure that students are graduating from secondary school and university with the skills to succeed in a more competitive globalised world. In a volatile age of rapid disruption, agility and optionality are key assets. I always discourage young people from studying law, unless they want to be a lawyer. STEM subjects, including computer science, financial subjects, quantitative subjects, even the liberal arts, are far better grounding than an arid vocational degree which is not going to be used in a profession. As Catherine Livingston observed at the National Press Club earlier this year, we need to move urgently from a discussion about protecting the jobs of today to creating the jobs of the future. And that includes ensuring there's a workforce skilled in the attributes required by business. Now we know that advances in computing and software in particular are driving the latest wave of disruption. And yet there's been a sharp decline in the number of students studying computing at university. A recent report from the Australian Computer Society and Deloitte Access Economics found demand for ICT workers in Australia will increase by 100,000 people over the next five years. But the number of IT graduates with a bachelor or postgraduate qualification almost halved between 2002 and 13. Despite a marginal increase in the number of engineering graduates, there is a clear gap between the forecast demand for ICT workers and the current pipeline of supply. This is a clear market failure, and it's something we must urgently address. Business and political leaders, and of course universities and school councils, parents, have an important role to play in promoting the benefits of courses such as computer science. We need to move beyond outdated stereotypes of the IT worker as a nerdy guy in a brown cardigan and promote the virtues of a computing qualification as an excellent generalist degree, the arts or law degree of the 21st century. In Australia, almost half of all workers with an ICT qualification work in non-ICT fields such as advertising and 52% work in industries outside of ICT itself. Now, with all, you may think I'm being harsh talking about cardigans and, and nerds, but let me tell you, this, these cultural images are a real problem. This is a, one of, it is one of the significant challenges to, or obstacles to raising the appallingly low percentage of women in the ICT uh, workforce and indeed studying ICT subjects at university. Uh, and this is, uh, Cheryl Sandberg has written and spoken a lot about this, uh, and it is, it is very, it, it is a, it's a big issue. You know, women hold up half the sky, they're half of all of our intellectual capital, the more modest men among us would say considerably more than half, and yet they are dramatically underrepresented in this most important part of the economy. Now, the, the importance of STEM to our economy shouldn't be underestimated, and nor is it new. Uh, Ian Chubb, our chief scientist, has observed that approximately two-thirds of Australia's economic growth per capita in the 40 years to 2005 came from improvements in our use of capital, labour and technological innovation, and demand will continue to accelerate. 75% 
of the fastest growing occupations now require STEM skills. So our education system has to equip students with the skills to meet this demand, like reading, writing and arithmetic, ICT skills such as coding and computational thinking are becoming so critical that they should be embedded across the curriculum, from foundation to year 10 as part of the digital technology syllabus. Where dig while digital technology is critical, given the rate of technology adoption in Australia, even among very young children, it's important that we move beyond only teaching students how to consume technology and instead focus on technology creation. And that's why last year the UK's ICT cur curriculum was replaced by a new computing curriculum with students as young as five and six receiving coding lessons. Uh, I strongly support this approach and I encourage educators in Australia to embrace machine languages and computational thinking as skills that are as fundamental in the 21st century as reading, writing and arithmetic, the three R's. The government is investing three and a half million dollars in a coding across the curriculum program to ensure all students gain exposure to coding in primary and secondary schools. And we've committed $500,000 to trial a P-TECH style program in Geelong. P-TECH is an education pathways partnership between IBM and the New York Education Department where students graduate with an associate degree along with the skills to continue studying or transition directly into an IT job. So, my friends, we are living, I sincerely believe, in the most exciting, revolutionary, disruptive time of human history. The opportunities for creation and innovation have never been greater. A globalised economy, supercharged by the internet, amplified by one new technology every day, is the most exciting environment for us to live in and for our children to grow up in. But we have to have the skills and the attitude and the culture to take advantage of it. Technological education, quantitative thinking, machine languages, agility, optionality, being prepared to embrace the future. And as I've said to you several times now, because it's, I don't want you to forget it, to treat volatility as your friend. The, this, is, this is a time of great and disruptive change and it is an opportunity, not a threat. The winners, be they individuals, firms or countries, will be those that embrace the future with a passionate and innovative enthusiasm. And I have no doubt that Australia, with the guidance of luminaries such as CEDA and the wisdom that you'll hear later today, will be among the leading countries that are able to do that. Thank you very much.